All right. Uh, good afternoon. We're going to start. Um, my name is Aaron Portnoy, and it's my co-presenter Cody Pierce talking about Microsoft RPC auditing tools and techniques. I'm going to start off with a uh, quick about us. We work for a company called Tipping Point. It develops uh, intrusion prevention systems. We're out of Austin, Texas in the U.S. Um, our team handles pen testing, vulnerability uh, analysis, uh, patch analysis, and a bunch of things like that, research, uh, basically research oriented. Um, you can keep tabs on us on the website above there, which contains our blog and upcoming advisories, published advisories, uh, appearances, and other things like that. We are authors and contributors to uh, the Sully Fuzzing Framework with my coworker Pedram Amini and I released at Black Hat. Um, spoke about at Blue Hat and at Black Hat Japan. Um, Cody spoke at Black Hat about uh, PyMU, which is a Python-based uh, x86 emulator. And we're both contributors to the PyMA reverse engineering framework. So today we're going to talk about Microsoft RPC, um, so a tool set that we've developed, um, different techniques we use to audit it specifically. Um, I'm going to start off with why are we talking about RPC in 2007, because it's generally considered something that's fairly well known. Uh, we're going to talk about the history of MSRPC briefly, about some of the vulnerabilities it's had, uh, some of the issues it's had, uh, some of the mitigations Microsoft's taken. I'm going to go through how it works, both from a developer standpoint and down to a security researcher and auditor, reverse engineer, uh, how you would see it from that level. I'm going to go through some of the existing tools that are out there um, and some of the issues with actually auditing it, all the steps. I'm going to walk through a quick audit on knowing nothing about an RPC service to being able to communicate it with our tools. And we're going to release the tools and do a demo on um, a CA product, actually. So we're going to start off with why do we care about MSRPC? It's been covered for quite a few years. Um, the main reason we're still dealing with it, as you can see here, sorry, um, there's still bugs being put out. It's 2006, 2007, the Razman's DNS workstation, distributed file system, all bugs, high impact, and a lot of them are still fairly simple stack smashes, things like that, that actually aren't very hard to find. Um, another big bullet point here we have is talking about third parties that implement RPC. So you have Samba that you know, re-implements all the Microsoft RPC services. You have Computer Associates, which implements a, a bunch of their own custom things. Uh, Trend Micro, which does a bunch and has several vulnerabilities that have come out in the last couple months in their RPC services. Um, we've also discovered that many of the RPC services that Microsoft still has haven't been fully audited. In fact, we have two bugs that we found in the, with our framework that were reported to Microsoft a couple weeks ago um, that are fairly simple, but you wouldn't have been able to find them if you can't marshal all the NDR data correctly. So there's still simple Microsoft bugs that are out there. And trying to audit Microsoft or third-party RPC is still pretty difficult because the, uh, uh, the representation of the data is actually extremely complicated once you get into certain levels of embedded structures and things like that. I'm going to go through all that um, in the next sections. So brief history of some of the bugs in RPC. Um, RPC bugs in MSRPC go back as far as 1998. Just DOS is back up until then, and we go all the way currently to uh, vulnerabilities that are still being released uh, nowadays. As you can see, there's just a few on there. Just some of the important ones, you can see the MSO3026, which resulted in the blaster worm. There are a few other large ones. Um, a few other issues that MSRPC's had, interface hopping, null sessions. Interface hopping is just an architectural flaw where you can reach specific services if there's any open endpoints. Just going to go over some of the mitigations that the Microsoft's taken with that. Um, they've created some architectural mitigations such as name pipe firewalls and null session restrictions. Um, currently there's still problems with RPC and the fact that uh, despite the architectural changes they've made to MSRPC itself, third parties can still do extremely bad things in their implementations. Um, it's almost as if they have the mentality that people can't communicate with their services, so they don't care what uh, they do with that. For instance, CA, Brightstore, if you actually search for vulnerabilities in that, you will find that there's an obscene amount. Um, the demo we're going to do has an RPC service that has 400 different functions that are available, and none of the Microsoft ones even come close to having that many. Um, then you have stuff like the Novell print services, which a few bugs have been released uh, this month, actually. So just quickly to go over why this was, or RPC was originally developed. Um, client-server model for remotely calling functions. 
Sorry about that. Um, what Microsoft did was try to provide a simple way for developers to do remote communications, um, forked it off the DCE standard, the Open DCE standard, and then Microsoft um, core services use a lot of that for uh, communicating between domain controllers and other systems you may have in a network. Um, RPC breaks down into you know, interfaces, um, opcodes, and things of that nature and to effectively uh, um, separate that or to allow a developer to easily communicate between those, they've had created stub functions that you know, have a format string how to call each function and um, you know, the programmer can just call through that as opposed to doing the marshalling himself. They do this um, by defining an IDL file, which is the different um, function arguments, the different data structures that are going to be used um, in each call. And then the communication layer, they provided TCP, UDB, um, SMB, name pipes, all these different transports to communicate between services. Um, they also have an endpoint mapper to do lookups on what's available. Inside of an actual um, binary that you know, handles RPC, they have, like I mentioned, a format string, and the format string is inside of the actual binary. It's hard-coded in there, compiled from the IDL, that tells each function how to marshal the data, um, which is important for us because when we rip that out of a binary, we're going to use a tools that will take the format string and convert it back into more, you know, human-readable form. And you also have important structures to set up the RPC interface, um, define any sort of permissions or um, the transport, things of that nature, and then you know um, a dispatch table for each function you provide. And we'll show, you know, like I said, a tool that will pull out all this information so that you can instantly, you know, figure out exactly what's being provided. Um, some of the problems with aud auditing RPC, I think, all stem from the fact that Microsoft designed it to be, um, you know, hidden away from the user, so that or the developer, so he doesn't have to worry so much about all the different data marshaling, how things going to um, be transported, things of that nature. So, you know, what you have to do is locate in any DLL or EXE that provides the RPC service because that's what you want to target. It has all the functions inside of it. Um, retrieving the IDL information, like I said, there's tools that exist. Um, that will pull that out for you, but that's all based off the of format string, which if you look in a binary and you're reverse engineering, it's kind of difficult to do it um, manually. Determining pipe names is, you know, which interfaces and how you can communicate with them. You have to pull that out of a binary. It's sometimes um, difficult to figure out. And then determining any authentication. Um, and then what we're going to focus on and what our tool set focuses on is a lot of the even lower level stuff, which is the NDR marshalling, how it is actually transmitted over the wire. You have all these, you know, functions, data structures, unions, you know, things like that that have to be specifically packaged so that the service will unmarshal it properly. And the biggest problem is that, you know, if you are um, not packaging this data properly, it'll get kicked back before you even get to the functions you're auditing. So if you're not spot on with um, how you package it and send it across the wire, it'll get rejected. You won't even get to touch all the functions that you're trying to audit. Um, you know, you'll see bad stub data is what actually the RPC exception that gets sent back. Um, debugging that can be a problem um, since, you know, anything that will import from RPC RT4, it'll actually call into it and, you know, um, it's kind of difficult to figure out exactly through embedded structures which one was not packaged properly. And then domain or computer name requirements. Oftentimes you have to provide, you know, um, a printer that's shared, you know, a share name, host names, domain controllers. You have to provide that information before you can even get to the lower level functions. Um, like I said, to pull out some of this IDL information, there's two tools that we have used. The first one is Unmiddle, Dave Atel. I think he's in the crowd over there. Um, based off a of model, retrieves IDL information from the format strings in the binary, uh, handles all the complex objects, basically reconstructs what was compiled down from a static binary so that you can look at all the different functions, parameters, structures, and things of that nature. So URL, 
The one we actually use the most is MIDA, and it does effectively the same thing. It's a plug-in for IDA. You can open a binary, just hit Control F7, and it'll pop up all the different functions that are available. You can click through them and see exactly where the RPC traffic will go to if you pass the NDR marshalling. Um, And some of the older tools that we just kind of wanted to throw up here, um, a lot of these are more for remotely querying pipe names and seeing what's available on a system. You have RPC dump, um, which everybody probably knows, um, pulling interface UUIDs, and we'll go into our tool set and how we kind of, um, you know, provide something to all this. Okay, so. Essentially, Cody had talked about uh, the IDL file. IDL file is the interface description language. It can basically, like he said, tells you how you can communicate with it. It'll tell you it has this many functions, here are the structures, here are the opcodes, this is how you would deal with it. Um, so because there's already tools out there that will give you, from a binary, will give you that IDL file, like unmiddle and MIDA, we decided to skip the process of actually pulling from a binary and instead lex and parse those IDL files into Python objects. So we wrote a lexer and a parser that will take an IDL file. Uh, it's mainly was developed using MIDA. Um, it works partially with Unmiddle right now. Um, essentially what it'll do is it'll pull out all the opcodes, all the arrays, the unions, the structures. It will uh, create Python objects for all of those. Um, it'll link them together. And we have a library of uh, NDR objects. NDR stands for network data representation. So that's the way that, um, for instance, a long value or a structure or a short or a character array is actually packaged for on the wire transport. So we have a library of NDR objects that uh, specify how to marshal all that information so it'll be correctly unmarshaled on the other end. Um, and you can also print out the byte stream. You can do all sorts of things like that. Um, we use Impacket, which is from core, to actually transport the uh, marshaled data across the wire. Uh, we extended its functionality a little bit to support context handles, which um, is the reason you can't audit a lot of the Microsoft-specific RPC services and people haven't found the bugs in them because they haven't been able to as far as we know, uh, handle a lot of the context handle communication whereby you will query one opcode, get a specific handle back that you need to use in order to query another opcode, and you wouldn't be able to call that other one if you didn't have a valid handle. Now we also have tie-ins for the Sully Fuzzing framework that just allows you to uh, fuzz any of the services that you may have discovered. So using our tool set, you're basically going to provide an IDL file. At that point, you just say parse this IDL, you get a Python list of UUIDs. For each UUID, you can step through all the opcodes. For every opcode, you can step through the elements. The elements could be a structure, a union, an array. Uh, it could be a base type, a long, a short, whatever the IDL file actually uh, defines. And you can pack any of that and transport it over the wire. So for instance, if you had a random RPC service you wanted to audit, you could dump the IDL, um, pick an opcode, and essentially say, uh, parse this IDL, and I want to call opcode whatever, and it'll send it over the wire, and uh, you won't have to worry about any of the marshalling, which can get quite complex if you have um, a decent sized opcode. I mean, you're talking about uh, thousands of bytes worth of data that have to be exactly spot on. If you're one byte off, it will not uh, even get to the function you want to audit. Um, you can populate any of these objects with any data that you may want. For a string, for instance, you could give it a domain name or whatever the hell you want, essentially. Um, we built a quick little GUI that we're going to show a little bit later if we have time. That. Uh, once you kind of expand out all the NDR ob or all the uh, IDL objects, so you can see uh, the class hierarchy of whatever it is you're dealing with in a tree structure. Um, the entire process takes about a second on the largest Microsoft IDL, being about 2,000 lines, which is the LSA service, and it will give you all these objects uh, ready to go, and you can talk to the service. Um, why is this useful? We're saying it's useful because y the NDR marshaling process is extremely error prone, like I mentioned. If you're a byte off, you will not be able to talk to these services. And that's why some of the bugs that um, we've been dealing with, you would not be able to do by hand, or it would take you a long time to do by hand, and that's why a lot of those bugs are still turning up, because people are starting to do it. Uh, and this tool set makes it a lot easier. So a quick example, this is a byte stream you would have to write for just a small, one of the smaller opcodes actually, in uh, one of the Microsoft RPC services, and this is a few pages long, just to give you an idea. You would have to do this by hand, whereas any of these bytes being off will not work. And that's everything from padding to uh, different pointers, all sorts of kind of complex stuff. Um, I'm going to go over some of the supplementary tools that we've developed. Uh, 
aside from the toolset. The toolset lets you lex and parse and talk to the RPC service. Um, we wrote a few other tools that actually help you in locating the, uh, the IDLs and the binaries that define such uh, RPC services. So we have one script that will recursively go through a directory and give you IDL and IDB generation. We have some PyDebug scripts. PyDebug is a Python-based scriptable uh, x86 debugger. That, so basically you'll be able to, if you happen to be developing anything um, with relation to RPC and you want to deal with uh, debugging it, we have some PyDebug scripts that hook into RPC RT4, dump format strings and kind of help you. It's more for developing than auditing. Um, some tools for binary name pipe extraction that basically uses IDA Pro uh, to pull out some of the name pipes that you will need to be able to talk to some of these services and some symbol inference stuff. And Cody's going to go through some of these. Uh, is this you? Uh, that's you. Oh. Uh, well, the first tool is, um, like I said, it will recursively go through a directory, find any execs or DLLs that import RPC RT4. Then it'll go through and find uh, any of the imports that match RPC server uh, functions specifically. It will then launch IDA Pro, which is a disassembler. Uh, and it will run the MIDA plugin, so it'll provide you with IDLs and IDBs for any discovered modules. So you can essentially have, say you install some product and you want to know if it has any RPC, you can run the script on the program files directory for it and it will f tell you any services that will define RPC. And then you can go through and see if you know, any are named pipes or TCP. You have all the IDBs, which are the files that IDA saves. It's all done in batch mode and it's all autonomous, so you literally hit up enter. I'll demo this later. So in, de in developing this tool set, we had to write a couple of custom scripts that aid in um, debugging some of this information. A lot of it depends on, you know, like I said earlier, um, you call into a DLL Microsoft provides, RPC RT4. And you know, inside of that, depending on what kind of data you're in marshaling, it'll call through different functions. And in order to track it down, um, we haven't showed an IDL yet, but um, you will have structures that embed structures that embed structures with an array of um, you know, data types. And when you're really deep into a data structure, it's pretty hard to tell which specific point failed. And so to fix some of that, we wrote these scripts that um, you know, breakpoint on any time RPC raise exception is called, and from there we can trace it back. So we provide a lot of these scripts, not necessarily um, that they're useful since we've done a lot of that for you, but if you want to go in and take a look, they're kind of interesting. Um, the script hooks, those points I mentioned inside of RPC RT4, um, RPC raise exception, and um, a couple of different unmarshalling routines that you can see. And you know we did our debugging in Windows XP SP2 in 2000, so it'll work in that. Um, we also have some scripts that um, will pull out the format strings and correlate that between the IDL you saw and the format string, and which function will be called inside of RPC RT4 to handle that type of data to unmarshal it. Um, in order to communicate with any of the RPC services, you have to have a pipe name. So we provide a script that will just pull that out. And the way it does that is we do a cross-reference to the use protocol sequence call inside of RPC RT4. We back-reference that. We trace back up the um, what would be the stack uh, statically. And we pull out the call for the um, you know, pipe name. And that is, provides an easy way for you to open a, open a binary, your auditing, run this script and have it pull out that pipe so that you can communicate with it with our tools. And Aaron will demo, you know, taking all this information and going from not knowing anything about a service, pulling the pipe name, communicating, and actually calling functions. This is a concept we, um, you know, came up with to help with things like the context handles. Um, you know, Aaron mentioned that a lot of times you have to have a valid context handle before you can even call you know, the rest of the opcodes. So what we want to do is try and use provided symbols to figure out which is going to be the first opcode we may need to call. Um, there's other ways to do this that we actually do. We look for any IDL that may take a context handle as an out parameter, you know. But, um, for certain things, we can use a symbol like open printer ex. 
Um, if we see something like that, we may have a list and realize that if we're going to call anything in the spooler service, we may want to call the ones that will open a printer first. You know, things like that will help us infer what you know needs to happen first before we can further audit the rest of the services. And you know, like it says, it allows for better code coverage, allows you to access more of the opcodes you may want to audit or find interesting. All right, so. I'm going to walk through uh, a complete audit from start to finish of a uh, CA product, um, specifically BrightStore ArcServe Backup, which has, it's the service that has the 400 opcode interface that I had mentioned earlier. And um, we actually are going to show a bug that we just found last night. It's probably not exploitable, but there's so many in the service that it really doesn't matter anyway. So um, Cody will narrate, I guess. So like we mentioned, this is, you know, what we're trying to provide here is a way to audit these services. You know, RPC does exist. People still use it. There's still bugs. Um, and I think a lot of the problem is that people don't know how to go from point A to point B and don't have all the necessary tools. Tools exist to pull pipe names. Tools exist to do the IDL, things of that nature. But there was never a gap to really go from, you know, zero to auditing quickly. So what we're going to try and do is go through that process and um, as a researcher or someone looking for bugs or wanting to test their product can go through um, quickly and easily. So. so the first step we're going to do is um, I'm going to run that script that I had mentioned earlier that will recursively go through a directory and tell you what imports RPC functions. So assuming you just installed CA BrightStore, you give it the program file directory. This is used as PE file by Arrow Carrera. It just checks the imports, finds any RPC services that may be listening. So you can see uh, it's finding ascore.dll and asdbi api or asdbapi.dll. Um, so the next step is is we're just going to see which if there are any processes running on the system that have name pipes, which there will be. Um, this is just using Process Explorer from uh, from Sys internals. If you search for name pipe, you'll notice. There's a name pipe named ASCore and also one named ASDBI or ASDB API, which matches the DLLs and execs um, that are in the program files directory. So you can safely assume that you can communicate with those services using the name pipe over RPC, um, and they're handled in those two uh, DLLs. And using Process Explorer is a real easy way to just verify those DLLs that got pulled out because you can search by handle name. You can search for all the name pipes on the system as you're, you know, you're already on the, on the system, so you can um, quickly. Anyway, um, so that that uh, batch script dumps the IDB and the IDLs for you. Um, this is IDA Pro, and it's just a, the ASDB API, which we're going to use as the example. If you were to run MIDA in here, you will see that it has these 400 different interfaces. And each one, this is um, the IDA plugin that we mentioned. Each one is a function. Each opcode will call into that function. And as he selected one of them, this is exactly where you would hit if your data got unmarshaled um, and if everything checked out from the RPC RT4 side, call up to the actual um, CA binary, the service that they wrote. So. You know, with these tools, we don't re like a developer. We don't really care about the unmarshalling things of that nature. We shouldn't. We just want to hit each of these RPC functions and do it easily. So at this point, what we've done is you found the process, you found the name pipe. So if you want to communicate with this, uh, the last bit of information you need is the IDL. So you're going to need to know uh, which opcode you want to call. You're going to need to know the structures and any of the unions, um, and you need to know how to pack all that data. So for instance, if we want to call opcode hex A. Um, we have the IDL because that script uh, batch generated it. I'll pull it up here. And you can see here, it defines a UUID. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but it defines a UUID and it goes through all the different structure elements. So we decided we'll call opcode hex A. As you can see here, uh, this tells you where it's defined in the binary at this address. Um, it takes in a handle T. The handle T argument um, isn't transmitted over the wire, so we don't actually have to worry about that. 
uh, has a conformant varying array of size 256, length one element. So it's basically saying that there's a struct two, that's element two. Also has a character string and two shorts and another structure. So normally, if you were to audit this, you would have to pack all this by hand. So you'd have to uh, do all the different uh, sizes and max size and all that kind of thing for the conformance varying array, and you have to get that right. You'd have to then include structure two, which as you can see up here, contains a long, a character, array of 16, all these different elements. Long array. And oftentimes, um, this, is, this example is just really primitive data types, but you could have struct two include an array of struct sixes, and struct six may have a union that has um, you know, 30 different cases that you need to actually, for code coverage purposes, call each one. And so our tool set will do all that in a manageable way, as opposed to you having to, and I've done it a million times developing it, had to write all these by hand. Um, as he, go back to the opcode. If you, if you see a sizes and length is, it's actually an array. And you have to know how to package all that and how to specify the array so that it properly gets um, sent up to the function you're trying to hit. Um, strings are the same way. Um, you know, little, little bits like handle T not getting transmitted, that's handled by our tool set. You don't have to go research that and figure out exactly what does and does not get you know, transmitted on the wire, which is a big um, time saver. And this example is, it's not the easiest, but it's also not the complex. If you look at some of the Microsoft ones, I mean, these things are obscene. They're thousands of bytes. You know, you'll have 16 structure deep unions and things like that. Just extremely hard to do by hand. Um, that's just the beauty of the stuff that we've been working on is you can just point it at it, say, basically click and go. And this one doesn't have symbols. When we talked about symbol inference, if you have symbols um, for the DLL or EXE, you may be looking at, you know, the, it says long sub. 28E, this would actually be a symbol name, which is where we get into parsing that and trying to infer some data from it, like open printer. So this is the address right here where this opcode is specifically uh, defined in the binary. So we can actually jump to that. You'll see this is where your code should hit if you pass all the marshalling. Uh, this is where your execution should end up if you pass all the marshalling problems um, and you manage to get here. So if you want to audit this, um, this would be the address you want. So I am going to attach to this process uh, and set a breakpoint on that so we can see that we actually do unmarshal everything correctly. You should use the immunity debugger. See, I would use the immunity debugger, but uh, it's Python 2.5, and that breaks a lot of the stuff that we wrote in 2.4. But now I'm just uh, attaching to the process that defines this name pipe. going to set a breakpoint on there and make sure that our data actually gets there. In the meantime, so basically I'm, I'm going to use our tool set now, just calling parse test. It's just a little uh, bootstrap program I wrote. Show them how it showed parse test. Sure. Parse test is something that you can use to call. You provide the IDL like we mentioned. You can provide an opcode just to call one. Um, and um, this is how you actually access all these objects inside of Python with the, when you import um, our Lexer, when you import our NDR types. Um, this is how you would use it in a script to talk to some of these services. If you notice, um, you have IDL equals main file name. That's actually responsible for parsing or lexing um, an IDL file into all the objects we're going to later use. And it says, you know, for each UUID and IDL. So it's all packaged um, so that you can loop through it. They're all in a list. Um, sorry. Um, they're all in lists so that you can easily access them. You can call through any of the opcodes you want. You can call through any of the interfaces you want. Um, it provides a real simple way to get at that data. You know, we just have some of this in here left over. You know, you can specify which UUID you may want to hit send it or just check out the data, so. So now we're attached to the process. I'm just going to let it go. And I'm going to breakpoint on the handler for opcode uh, 10. So I'm going to run that parse test. I'm going to give it the IDL file, uh, give it the IP address, the pipe name, and the opcode number. 
So what this is going to do is going to take the IDL, it's going to completely parse the entire thing, um, and it's going to specifically package uh, opcode 10 and send it over the wire to that IP address. So when we do that, you can see it's parsing it. It's found hex 4E structures, that many unions, that many opcodes. So just, um, you know, if you see uh, all this data, is, you saw the structure was pretty simple. You had long, you had, you know, arrays and things like that. You know, this data shows shows a lot of that information. But what you're not seeing sometimes is padding. There's necessary padding for each structure um, or alignment and uh, different array types, you know, require different data to be packaged with it. So, you know, that's all done for you. And we just printed it out so you can see it. And you can see we hit the breakpoint. Um, I don't know if you can read it down here, but it says breakpoint hit. Um, at this point, you could begin your audit and you can, um, you can set any of the data back in the original script that parses and sends the opcode across. So you could say, I want that long element four to equal, you know, hex 20. Um, so then you can sit here and audit and actually see your, da your data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just let this go and you'll see it access violation when executing zero. So this is a stupid bug on their part. They jump into a DLL that they haven't, uh, that they haven't loaded yet. So if you had some kind of four byte overwrite, you could fake this V table and get execution. I mean, there's a, a lot of bugs in this program. Like I said, they have 400 opcodes. It's kind of obscene. But this one will actually crash the service entirely. If I pass that exception, the whole thing goes down and the service dies. So CA doesn't know about that, but I'm sure they probably don't care because they have worse things to worry about. But yeah, um, this error is just because the service died, so it doesn't know how to respond to that specifically. Um, I'm just going to pull up one of the Microsoft IDLs real quick so you can see. RPC services that are in something like Windows 2000, um, everybody knows about. But when you actually run our scripts that dump all the um, DLLs that provide an RPC pipe, you'll see there's actually quite a lot of them. Um, some you'll know, LSA serve, locator, um, spooler. But then there's also these other ones that a lot of people haven't seen or looked at because it may be a lesser used service. Um, you know. Some people you may not have it started, things like that. So, you know, there's quite a bit that Microsoft even has left that people aren't really looking at. So. And a lot of these have not been fully audited at all because we found some simple bugs in these that it's not simple quite to reach them, but the bugs themselves are simple. Um, our tools that makes it a lot easier because you don't have to worry about any of the marshalling issues. But I mean, some of these bugs, there'll be six structures deep and it's a stack overflow, but because nobody's been able to actually talk to the service before, you may not see these things. Um, some of these are quite large. This specific IDL is one of Microsoft's and it has something like six or seven, I guess, interfaces exposed, yeah. RPC SS. Um, I'm going to show you something we have in the works, which is our uh, GUI that will allow you to actually have a visual representation of this stuff. This is and the... This was, we did this, um, you know, last week, like the day before we left. So it's a little crude, but this is a WX Python GUI. And we did this so that you can visualize how all these data structures are linked together. In the final version, which we will probably finish next week or maybe the plane run back, you will be able to click on an object, show what the data for that object is in the right pane, and edit it and then send it over the wire. And we have menu hooks to set up a host, set up things like that, so that you can just take an IDL, pop it in this GUI, it automatically splices it together for you in the correct data structures and functions, opcodes. And then from there you can go in and manually um, touch different pieces of it for code coverage purposes or whatnot. So if you notice, um, we talked about embedded structures, things like that, that get pretty complex. If you look at one of these opcodes, argument three of that function um, you know, has two longs, an array of strings, and then embeds or has an array of W strings. I can't see that far. It looks like a w, wide character string. 
I mean, these things can get arbitrarily complex. This is not one of the most complex ones. And you can see it's, it's a few structures deep. Um, yeah. But like I said, so marshalling some of this data can get extremely difficult. Ooh, server service. This is server service. Or edit the theory. But we'll show another one that gets pretty complex. And it's, it's really nice to visualize it in the GUI. You know, when we're just dumping hex out, you can't tell all the different um, items that are being sent across. So it's kind of what, why we did the GUI. That's still RPC. The last one was server service. This one is RPC SS. You can see that this one has a bunch of different UUIDs. So these are all the available interfaces you can talk to. So with the script, you know, you can put, I want to talk to you the second interface call opcode 3 and provide this kind of data. So I guess that's it for the Microsoft IDLs. If anyone's curious about this CA one, you can essentially call any of the first 20 opcodes and crash the service instantly, um, which takes about five seconds. But um, I guess that's it for the demo. Um, let me see. Yeah, I guess, are there any questions? We've actually done the opposite. That makes sense, though. We could easily do that. We mostly were sniffing traffic to see why we were screwing up originally uh, to get a better idea of how it was marshaled. But we could easily, um, using our NDR library, unmarshal data on the wire, which would probably be pretty useful for Wireshark because I know that they're missing a lot of the protocol decoders. Yeah, there's a, they handle maybe Spore and a few others, I think. Yeah. So actually, that's something viable we could probably do. So we have a pretty good understanding of having done all these by hand, how to unmarshal a huge block of stub data. So something to look into. Anybody else? I think that's all we had, essentially. Are we early? We're yeah. a little early. No more questions at all? Nothing. OK. I guess we're going to cut it short then. Thank you. Just...